uh, doing our next teacher talk is Courtney Powell. Good morning. Good morning. We good? Yes. People often ask me why I chose the field of education. My answer, I would imagine, is very similar to yours. I love children. And while I, of course, love teaching and the subject content, it's really the kids that get us up every day here or even into our classrooms. I'm here today to talk about my journey as an educator, how my mind has shifted greatly in my approach for my students, and how to best meet all of our students' needs. I am passionate that all students are capable of learning, and I truly believe that we can achieve great things in our classrooms. My passion for equity is deep-rooted in who I am and starts with my family. I come from a, a family of people who struggle with dyslexia. These three men each had a unique, difficult journey to overcome their learning differences. I remember my father telling me stories of being in the slow class in elementary, middle, and even high school. Of course, he attended school in the 60s and 70s, so much of what we've done with special education students has changed, or so we hope. He's explained that the general feelings of the classrooms that he was in were that you were nothing. You weren't going to succeed. Just get through the 45 minutes, and you're no longer my problem. He was secluded from his other friends. Isn't it a strange, self-fulfilling prophecy that many of the people that my father attended school with lived very difficult lives? Without my father's unflappable determination and work is never done attitude, his own life would have been very different. It was the struggles that I witnessed with my brothers and my father that inspired me to become a special education teacher. I vowed to break that cycle, and I thought I was doing just that. Prior to teaching at LAW, I worked at the Flack Educational Collaborative as a substantially separate autism spectrum disorders classroom teacher. I worked with students from K to five who presented with a variety of cognitive, behavioral, social, emotional, mental health, and even trauma-based disorders. It was a busy, rock and roll, dynamic classroom, but I loved those kids and I loved coming to work every day. Yes, I can was our motto. I fostered a strong belief that every child was capable of learning, and I fought for my students to have the same rights as their typically developing peers. I do believe that I made a difference with those students, but I know now that if I had been given the opportunity to teach again there, I would do things very differently. After teaching in sub-separate for seven years, I wanted to test the waters in the general education setting. I thought I would be the perfect addition to an elementary classroom. I knew how to teach every student. Within a year, I joined our district's inclusive practice team. We began a journey of universal design I told myself I would be perfect for this team. I, of course, knew how to do this. This was going to be a breeze. But I quickly realized what I was doing in my own classroom was exactly the opposite of what I had vowed to do. If a student in my first grade classroom struggled with addition, I gave them a number line. They struggled to write, I'd scribe for them or give them a template. I was allowing them to be successful. It was in my own journey, though, that I realized I was, in a way, no better than my father's teachers. When I follow a student and consistently pull them for a small group, I'm telling them that they can't do something. When I modify everything that they do or sit close to them, I'm telling them that they are unable Maybe I don't say it out loud, but as six and seven-year-olds, they're already starting to categorize themselves as good or bad. It's that self-fulfilling prophecy. If I tell you you always need help, you will. It was through my journey that I began to understand the stark difference between what I was doing and what I could be doing. At the beginning, I identified what you needed in order to be successful. But now, I offer options that might help, and you choose what you need. You see, we're all less than in some areas of life and greater than in others. 
I would consider myself to be above average in understanding child development, probably to about age 12. Once they get into those teenage years, not my thing. I've taken coursework, I've completed research, I've worked with diverse populations in both elementary and early childhood levels. Comparatively, I would consider myself way below average when it comes to my ability to fix things around the house. Last year, I owned a small condo, and the water heater was in the guest room up in the um, closet. I was putting away some winter clothes, and I realized the water heater was leaking. And by leaking, I mean gushing down the walls, all over my clothes, on the carpet. I was petrified it was going to leak for, uh, through the floor below me, and I would have to pay for it. So I immediately did what we see all too often in our classrooms. I shut down. I cried. I yelled. I swore. Really great coping skills. But then I did exactly what those students who have labeled themselves as unable to do, do every day. I called for help. In this case, my father. I can't fix it, but he can. When I hung up the phone, I didn't even try to fix it. I just stood there. It was while I was driving to work the next morning that I realized something important. I'm not much different than those students in my classroom. I had told myself I was unable to do this, and therefore I was. So how did I change this in my classroom? I started very simply, and it's still a work in progress. In lieu of my typical means of teaching, I began to put ownership on the kids. It wasn't pretty at first. Like every skill, it took time and explicit teaching. I began to make my students self-reflective, even as six and seven-year-olds. After teaching a lesson, I asked the students to reflect on the concept at hand. How do you feel about that? Great? OK? You need a little bit of review. Do you feel lost? Would you like to work with me again? Then I asked them to think about themselves as learners, to take ownership of their own learning. Now think about you. Do you learn best when you're with someone, by yourself, on the floor, standing with manipulatives when you can draw. It was one of my students last year that I saw an immense change with in her ability to self-advocate and make independent choices. She was someone who struggled with a learning disability, and in her time in my classroom, she was picked up for an IEP. At the beginning of the year, I found myself following her through every center, sitting close to her, modifying her work, jumping in every time I saw a mistake. By the winter, I started to see a change in her. She was clearly feeling insecure, and she didn't want my help. But this went against everything I, as a teacher, knew was right for her. She struggles, so I have to help. Quickly became an issue for us both. I could feel both of us getting frustrated every day. I knew what she needed, but she didn't want it. But then I began my mind shift. Instead of telling her that she needed to do this specific task in this specific way, I began to let her and my other students make choices for themselves. It took a while, and like any skill, there were lots of bumps along the way. I don't get it. I can't do this. I need help were lots of things that I heard. But over time, I started to see a shift in their thinking their level of engagement, and their enjoyment in the classroom. Many of us have discussed, been trained in, or implemented growth mindset in the classroom. I thought I was doing it. You know, I talked about it with the kids. I read a book about it. I even made an anchor chart. But when I took a step back, I realized I wasn't actually giving kids the opportunity to do it to be challenged and grow their minds. I was jumping in every time they struggled. How could kids be engaged if I was the barrier to their learning? The little girl in my classroom often chose not to work with me. It gave her a sense of independence and pride to be without me with her peers. I remember one day she was working on a math problem and she 
totally set it up wrong. And I was physically grabbing the chair not to go over to her. But then something amazing happened. She saw the problem, she fixed it, and she did it right. When we lower our standards for our struggling students, they stay there. When we jump in and we help our students every time they struggle, they become prompt dependent and helpless learners. It's our natural instinct as teachers to help. That's why we came here in the first place. But I realized through this journey that sometimes helping is causing the struggle to occur. By the end of the year, that student was able to identify areas where she needed help and she asked for it. But most importantly, she knew what she was good at and she saw herself as a confident learner. I challenge you today to think of your students as you think of yourself. There are many things that you are good at and lots of things that you are not. It's our job as teachers to assist all of our students, young or old, typically developing or disabled, that they are responsible for their learning, they are capable of learning, and they have a role in their learning. It's a personal goal of mine to try and do more fix-it things around the house. Uh, will it be pretty? Absolutely not. It will probably cost me a lot of money to fix the mistakes along the way. But like my students, I know that I can only grow when I am challenged, and when I'm given the opportunity, I can achieve it. I leave you with this image. When a baby learns to walk, we expect them to fall along the way. When they do fall, they get up and they try again. They don't even really get too discouraged. Sometimes they need us to encourage or guide them, but we would never put a baby in a walker permanently because of a few falls. Sometimes we do this as teachers. We put kids in walkers. Let's change what we're doing. Let's give students the tools that they need in order to take those first scary steps. Some might need more, some might need a challenge, but we can lead all students to success. Thank you for your time.